I'd like to call to order the March 1st, 2022 workshop. Jenny, will you take roll call? Councilmember Thorson? Here. Councilmember Wong? Here. Councilmember Cole? Here. Acting Mayor Peterson? Here. And Mayor Furlong is absent. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Uh, can I have somebody adopt the agenda? I get a motion to adopt, entertain a motion. So moved. Okay, thank you. Second. Okay, thank you. Motion, uh, any opposition? Motion passes. I will say second, um, either one. They were simultaneously. City Manager, uh, John, do you want to introduce our guests tonight? Yes, thank you, Acting Mayor Peterson. Uh, we do have a, several um, topics tonight, a couple of presentations, and then a, a parking lot discussion. So our first presentation is from our Met Council representative, Sue Vento, uh, and I'll let Sue, I, I told her she could sit or, or stand. It's at her discretion. Thank you, thank you. This is, oh, well, yeah, I'll take credit for it. <laughs> um, we, we, we get hit on a lot for a lot of things, so I'll take credit for the weather on behalf of the council. Good evening. It's, it's good to see you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. It's just temporary. We, we see each other on um, RCLLG Zoom, so in this Zoom world. My name is Sue Vento. I'm the, your Met Council rep. I was here pre-COVID, so it's been a while, and um, it's great to be back. Um, I wanna um, just give a little bit of an update. I don't have a lot to report, but mostly I wanna listen to see if there's anything I can be doing to help. Um, just as a little background, I was appointed in um, uh, winter of 2019. I have to really kind of roll back the, the clock here in my head. It's Everything's pre-COVID, post-COVID, so it was pre-COVID. March of 2019, I started. I get to represent you along with um, 13 other communities, um, 12, 12 cities, two townships, going from Linwood Township up just west of Stacy, although I don't represent Stacy or Forest Lake, and then straight down to um, the south end of Maplewood. Um, the, the cities and townships I represent include a portion of, of Anoka, a portion of Washington, and then a chunk of Ramsey. So um, it's it's a geographically big district, and it's population-wise, it's a big district. I actually did a little tabulation recently to see how many residents there were. Um, I gotta begin by just saying I am awestruck with everything you all have going on in North St. Paul. Although I live in Maplewood, I'm up here a lot. Um, I have an 11-year-old Maltese poodle, and his vet is located here in, in North St. Paul. And just both commercially and residentially, you've just been knocking it out of the park, so I want to congratulate you. Um, as you already know, your 2040 comp plan was approved. You guys did a great job on that, along with your awesome staff. Your um, your uh, Livable Communities Act participant, and. We will have um, some grant information coming in the next few weeks. So there will be LCA grants available again. Um, we are asking, um, well, we will also have some, we also have some water efficiency grants. So if you have um, residents here who are looking for ways to uh, um, buy new appliances for their homes, water, producing appliances for their homes. Um, if you apply for the, the grant, there's the opportunity for your residents to, to get credits for their, their appliance purchases that, that save water. It's a program that a number of communities have used and have found very popular. Um, and this is available through our Environmental Services Division at the Council. Um, you can either contact me or contact the Environmental Services Division directly. Um, there are, well, um, um, also be the regional solicitation grant funding cycle going here. It's a two-year cycle, occurs every two years. We work with the Transportation um, Advisory Board in distributing the dollars. We're expecting more money this year than normally because of the federal in infrastructure bill. 
And um, in addition to that, um, you've probably already heard about the COVID dollars that are coming through the Minnesota Department of Transportation. So all of those resources are helping a little bit. You know, not a lot, but as we know, every little bit helps. So um, that's some good news. Um, currently in the legislature, we're seeking fi $5 million for um, um, inflow um, INI programs and possible grants to reduce the amount of surface and groundwater that ends up in our waste system, waste treatment system. If we can come up with ways to catch that before it ends in the waste treatment system, it saves our, our waste treatment systems um, a lot of wear and tear and cost. And with the population growing the way it is, every way we, every way we can find to help kind of limit how much more we have to put into that infrastructure is beneficial. So capturing the surface and groundwater is, is a project that a few communities have, have tried and actually one here in, in this District 11 is Hugo. They have done some, some um, surface and groundwater capture and used it um, for uh, irrigation and sprinkling systems for some of their residential areas. So if you're interested in that, that's also a wonderful opportunity and we're hoping to get, to get that funding through the legislature. The other legislative piece that I wanna make a push for is um, that the uh, council um, works with and for the Metropolitan Parks and Open Space Commission, um, or as it's frequently known, MPOSC. And MPOSC works with the 10 regional park systems that um, represent the 56 regional parks we have here in the Twin Cities. It covers 50,000, excuse me, 54,000 acres, 400 miles of trails, including the wonderful gateway that goes right through here, and then um, eight special recreation features. 63 million people visit those parks and trails annually, so they are very popular, and we know that during the last two years, they've become even more popular. The parks and trails have really been a source of stress relief and, and socialization for folks during COVID. So um, we're asking for three million, or we're seeking three million, actually I'm seeking more than that. We need more than three million, but that's a private agenda I've got going um, on my own, not on behalf of the council. So um, that's a little bit of what's happening at the legislature. Um, we uh, do have a, a dire need for um, bus drivers. We are looking for, we've had to cut back on our, our um, bus routes, both as a result of a decline in ridership, but even more significantly because of a, a, a need to get more bus drivers. So if you know of anyone in the community who is looking for a good job, there's a $1,000 hiring bonus, good benefits, good pay, um, and a, an important job. You know, they're the ambassadors many times for our community, um, both with new residents and long-term residents, and they really do make a difference. So if you know of anybody looking for a job, that's something to think about. So I'd like to listen and answer questions. And I think for Sue, at the top of your head. John. I think, you know, speaking maybe a little bit on behalf of the city council, we um, we had a council staff retreat uh, a little while ago, and one of the topics that is really important to us is the interchange of Highway 36 and Century. And, you know, we, we really view that as a, as a regional asset, and we're hoping that there can be a lot of players at the table, including the Met Council. And I've been at those meetings. Yes, you have, yep. yeah. I, yeah. I was at pre-COVID, <laughs> I was at a meeting was it here? Was it near here? It might have been. Here. It was here, yeah. And um, I remember eating a lot of popcorn that night as we were doing our mapping. But I'm, yes, the Met Council is very much a part of that, that discussion. And I have to tell you, I'm really impressed, A, with the legislators in this area who are really stepping up and helping advance it. Um, you folks especially, I think North St. Paul was one of the best representative, representative communities at that initial meeting I was at. And I couldn't tell from our last Zoom one who all was there. But I'm also really, really impressed with the counties. Um, I've had a lot of interaction with Ramsey County because I live in Ramsey County. But um, I'll tell you, Washington County has really stepped up as well. And um, they especially you know, have a lot to deal with as it relates to the impact of all that traffic on 36. So th they're, they're with you on that as well. And yeah. I, I will tell you, the reason I was 
late is I made the mistake driving up here of thinking, oh, I'm going to Caribou and I'm getting my tropical green iced tea. Um, no problem getting through Caribou, but getting back on 120 is like taking your life in your hands. So I didn't have to go all the way to Matamidi to get back going south, but I felt like I almost was going to have to. So we're totally with you on yeah. that. And I, I knew you were. I just wanted to remind you how important it is to these folks. Yes. Yeah. yeah, you can you can count on us with that. And frankly, um, um, the, 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 the bus transit has been a part of the conversation with it as well. Um, we know that there are, are, are folks that rely on, you know, transit to 3M, transit to Century, transit to downtown North St. Paul. So, you know, our, our bus line on there will be important. Um, just recently, there was a really horrid, serious accident. Uh, a pedestrian was, was killed um, just north of, of 94 on, on 120. So the, the need for um, the safe transit for pedestrians and bicyclists is important. Do you, do you have, uh, is there a, a, maybe a link or something that has ridership data from Metro Transit specifically for North St. Paul, or is there any I'm, kind of info? Oh, I'm sorry, I apologize. I, uh, Council Member Thorson, I'll, I'll, I'll find out. Um, I know we do have ridership data, but I don't know if it's broken down by community. But I'll see what I can find out. And um, I, it, I should be able to get that data. I don't know if it's available online, but I, I will definitely mm -hmm. check. That's a great question. Well, because obviously it's been impacted by COVID, but it'd be interesting as we're coming out of this and everyone's starting to go back to normal if we could compare pre-COVID and then after kind of monitoring that to see, you know, that impact that's had. That's a great question, and I will definitely find out. Um, I recently had a neighbor in my neighborhood ask me why we have empty buses driving around. And I said, well, we try not to, and we've been cutting back on that because we've had to. But I said, um, one of the things you need to realize is that those buses sometimes arrive much fuller than they look after people get off. Mm -hmm. And I described how one morning I happened to have a very early vet appointment with my dog. And on my way home, I was struck as I went down McKnight by the number of, of bus stops where there were a lot of people waiting for their buses. And I hadn't seen that before. And it was kind of showing up at a different time of day. So, you know, that, that transit information is, is, is invaluable. And I'll do what I can to get you some good information for North St. Paul. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sue. You look Thank like you. you're gonna, you're in our corner because we need all any, all of the support. Yes. Well, you, you can count that's, on that's, it. That Minnesota, that Department of Transportation is who we have to convince. So. Well, and I, I will tell you, I was really impressed with the meeting that last yeah. meeting they put together. I thought it was really well done. Yes, it was very good. They had a lot of facts, and I think uh, we're not on the back burner. I'm hoping it's gonna. Right. And that public engagement that night yep. was phenomenal. Yep. That makes a big difference. Yep. Very good. Thank you for your time. Oh, yeah, please. Check their security. Yeah. Um, did you like to uh, introduce them? Sure. So our next presentation is from the League of Minnesota Cities. I would say it's um, uh, part uh, kind of an update uh, and then par partly a, a special presentation. Uh, and so I would introduce Dave Umak, the executive director of the League of Minnesota Cities, and he can introduce his team, and you guys can either approach the, the podium or, or chairs, either one. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Thank you, John. Um, staff, members of the council, acting mayor. Candy Peterson, how Thank about you. that? Thank what you, David. Special time for I'm not for nervous at all. Aren't you nervous? <laughs> Well, I'll call the question then. <laughs> I understand this is a work session, so I'll We're be- pretty informal. Little, little, really informal. So my name is Dave Unmacht, as John said. I am the executive director of the League of Minnesota Cities. And uh, I have with me the president of the league, D. Love, who will speak second. He is the mayor of Centerville. And then I have the past president, Brad Wiersum, who is the mayor of Minnetonka. And, uh, our, our ace in the hole who does most of the work and gets us all ready to go, Luke Fisher is here, and he, 
he, uh, he passed out the, the, uh, the little gift bag that we have for you. So this all started two months ago when Luke and I were looking at the board roster at the league, and there's a few people on the board who are coming up on the end of their term. And um, during the course of our work, we get a chance to visit with many of our board members, depending upon their position and their role and what they do. And, and we knew that uh, we had not been to the North St. Paul City Council meeting yet to, uh, to thank Candy. And so I left a message for John, and I got this, uh, I'm out of the office for a month uh, voicemail, one of those kind of things. It actually, it wasn't just a week. And I, and I said, give me a call when you get back, because I'd like to be able to come. Luke and I were going to stop by and, and uh, surprise Candy with uh, a thanks, and very brief, very informal. And John said, oh, by the way, we have a workshop, and there is an opening in the agenda, because someone that was here to, to present couldn't make it. Would you mind coming in to make a brief presentation about the league and do what you wanted to do with Candy? And of course, we were all over that, right? Can I leave now? <laughs> Thank you. Thank Candy. Yeah, no. And so we thought, well, we can't do this without our leadership then. And then in a very quick email we sent to Dee and Brad, they both said they can make it. So that's why you have four of us here today instead of two. So it's a little different. But we're going to accomplish the objective. So thank you very much for letting us be here. We really appreciate it. So the League of Minnesota Cities is a, is a, is a multifaceted, uh, simple but complex organization, and we have a handout that has about eight pages of the many things that we do. We are the largest statewide city association in the state of Minnesota. There are other associations, you may have heard of them, the Metro Cities, there's the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, Minnesota Association of Small Cities, the last two you would not be part of for, for size and for location. But you certainly are a member of the league and have been a very active member of the league for many years. And we do a lot of things. We do advocacy at, at the state and federal level. We provide research, member services, litigation support and lead. We provide insurance services. And we are the go-to resource for cities that need, need an answer or need some help. And we get called by people every day, all day for very simple questions or very complex questions. And I won't go into the details of that because I know Dee and Brad want to say some things, but I thought that would be a really good resource for you if you're curious or you have not been active involved in the league before. Given that, we are here because one member of your council has been very active with us, has been an asset, been a resource, a wonderful addition to our board, and a great person. And uh, because of all that, we wanted to come here and thank her for that. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dee. He's going to talk a little bit, then he'll turn it to Brad, and then Brad will turn it back to me, and we will close. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Well, thank you, North St. Paul, for having us this evening. It's so great to be here. We thank you for the time on your agenda. As Dave noted, my name is Dee Love, and I'm the mayor of the city of Centerville, and I am your president this year, so very proud to be that. I can't say thank you enough to Candy, though. I know I'm, I'm going off script, Luke. Oh, Sorry goodness. about that. But I, I could not come up here and say words without saying thank you so much, Candy. So, there, you know, there's a lot of things about Candy that we want to recognize, but I want to point out three. Oh, boy. <laughs> Number one, Candy brings treats to every meeting. I mean, and you know, here, guys. before I went on vacation, I was on a sugar free diet and you bring me treats. And it was so hard because it sat there in front of me the entire meeting and I just pushed it over to Brad. So it was okay. But we definitely appreciate you always thinking of us and always being so giving in that way. Secondly, though, Candy is an incredibly caring person. I know during our time together on the board, there's been some things that have happened in my life. And lo and behold, I open up my mailbox and there's a card from Candy. And I think, oh my gosh, I mean, she sent me a card. Who, who thinks to do that? And sometimes, even though <laughs> the situations were going on for a long time, I got multiple cards. And I thought, she, does she know she already sent me one or is she just really that nice? So I, I believe it's because you're just that nice. So I appreciate that so, so, so much. The final thing, though, is Candy has such a spirit. I mean, your spirit and what you bring to our board is immeasurable, and it's so appreciated by me and the other board members. Being Serving with you for the last three years, it's just been an absolute pleasure. It's been my pleasure, and I just want to say thank you for spending that time with us and me as a board member. So you're definitely appreciated. 
Thanks, Steve. All right, so now to get to my actual talking points. <laughs> Cities are the core of everything that we do at the league. Our association is really, really strong, and the reason it is so strong is because of our board, people like Handy, Brad, and myself, our legislative policy committee said a lot of people have an opportunity to apply for and be a part of. Conversations and event gatherings, um, hopefully everyone's coming up to Duluth in June. We look forward to seeing you there. And through meetings like this, um, you open up your city halls for us so that we can come out and speak to you and take questions and just have an opportunity to be face to face with each of you each time. But two big points I really wanted to spend a little extra time focusing on tonight is PTSD for our first responders and civility. Those have been two things that have been really near and dear to me, so I just wanted to take a couple of moments to talk about it. When it comes to PTSD, our police and fire and emergency responders, they play a vital role in each one of our communities. They protect and provide public safety when we need it, and in all honesty, when we're at, their, when we're at our worst, we need them to be at their best, and we expect that from them. But we know that first responders sometimes have issues with mental illness and PTSD. And one of the important things that we're trying to really do right now is remove the stigma about that. You know, in the past, first responders, especially police officers, I'll, I'll point that out, you know, that was a tough community. That was a community that just kind of put everything to the side and said, we got this. And now we know that you know it wasn't always the case. Sometimes we didn't just have this. And we need help. And it's OK to say, I need help. And we want to make sure that that stigma is removed. We're working with a lot of different member organizations to create toolkits, to go to our legislature to address the issue, to just really try to help our first responders so that when it is time for them to respond, they can, and that they can get back to the jobs that they really love instead of having that stress of not being able to work as a result of this, this illness that is treatable and curable. The second thing and the last thing I wanted to talk about is civility. Now that's something that all of us around the country have an opportunity to have an impact on. We have that chance to go out and say, it is not okay to be incivil. It is not okay to not be respectful. It is not okay not to listen to one another. Those are all things that we all have human rights to do. And it seems odd to say, boy, we're going to push back against people being incivil. But I think it's our right to say we want to push back against people being incivil. We want to be civil. We want to provide an example. And I think here in Minnesota, we have an opportunity to lead the country back in the right direction that we want to go. So with that, I again want to say thank you for allowing us to come out tonight. Thank you, Candy, again, for being a part of our board. And I'm going to turn it over to past president, Mayor of Minnetonka, Brad Wiersel. Hey, Brad. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you, uh, D. Mr. President. We call him Mr. President. He likes that. Um, you only get it one year, and it goes quick. And we were talking about that. So uh, anyway, but thank you for your comments, D. And it's it's great to be here. Um, and uh, my my piece of the puzzle is that I I get to talk a little bit about candy. And I've known Candy for a long time because um, I remember when, well, it wasn't that long ago that Candy became a member of the league board. But Candy and I also worked on the Metro Cities board together um, a number of years ago. And uh, Candy's a pretty spectacular person. I've uh, really enjoyed working with her. Um, I, like, I like the fact that she tells you what she thinks. She doesn't pull any punches. She's honest. She's a straight shooter. Um, you know, this is a people business. Uh, what we do as the league is we work with people in 850 plus cities um, across the state. But um, this is a people business. And Dee talked about civility, and civility is so important. But we're also such a polarized society now. But if, if, we, if we just <coughs> listen to one another and respect one another as people, then then we're going to do a better job. We're going to do a better job as council members. We're going to do a better job as cities. And, um, and Candy has just been an outstanding example of that. Now, you know, her name is Candy, and she shares Candy with, uh, with the board, and that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a good marketing uh, approach. And I'm a marketer by training, so I appreciate that. 
But Candy is really a special person, and I've really enjoyed um, working with her. And you know, in Candy's time on the board, we've done it's been it's been a heck of a time to be on the board. Um, we've uh, we've lived through a, and it's it's been a heck of a time to be a council member in North St. Paul and all of our cities. The pandemic has been brutal, and this has been a people business. And um, yet we haven't seen one another. We've been th we've been behind plexiglass. We've been behind masks, and we've um, we've had virtual meetings. And so, in a people business, can, you know, keeping keeping the train on the tracks under those circumstances is challenging. But Candy always lightened things up at the meetings, and always found a way to make us smile. And um, you know, and she'd grumble about her golf game every once in a while. But you know, that's okay. That's just that's just that's just part of it. Um, one of the things that's happened, and you know, when the pandemic hit, let's be honest, we didn't know how our finances as cities were going to be, and how our finances as the um, as the league were going to be. I mean, it was a challenging time. It wasn't a time to ask residents for more taxes or members for more money. Um, but we've maintained strong finance as the league through, um, uh, through the pandemic, and the league's board and candy has been a part of that. And uh, I'm proud of what the league has been able to accomplish through the pandemic. And then the other thing is that we've, um, we've supported one another. And I will tell you and I will encourage you, to, if, if you're not involved with the league at all, to get involved. It's been one of the most rewarding aspects of public service for me. And I know uh, Candy's, Candy's enjoyed it. But again, it's the people that make it great. And, and the people who get on the league board are really pretty spectacular people. And the, the league staff and the organization are outstanding. So I'm, I'm really proud of that. But I'm thankful for Candy and for all of the league um, board members for the way that we've supported each other and encouraged each other. And um, I have to ask you a question. I have something in my pocket here. Um, and Dee referenced it a little bit. But you know, how many of you have ever gotten one of these? You know, and, and I've, gotten, um, I've gotten numerous of these. You know, they all seem to come from the same person. Um, but I can't tell you how much it means. I mean, as, um, you know, Dee had a, had a challenging year last year with his family, and Candy's encouragement meant a lot to him. I know it did. And, you know, Candy finds a reason to thank you and to congratulate you, and, and I, I'll tell you what, I hang on to these. It means a lot to me. And I didn't have to look very far to find this when I knew I was coming here tonight because I saved it because I really appreciate um, what, what Candy represents. So, you know, we are um, a better organization because of the people that make us. And Candy has been just an outstanding and stellar representative of the city of North St. Paul, um, of the league. And I personally have just greatly enjoyed uh, working with her. So. I want to, Candy, I want to thank you so much. It's been fun. It will continue to be fun. We're not done yet. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Brad. Any <laughs> One of the reasons that it's great to be a staff member of the league is because we get to work with excellent people. And on our board are elected officials and appointed officials. And most of them are elected, but there are some appointed officials too. So you got a little flavor today of three of the people I get to work with every day, and that's D. Love, Brad Wiersum, and Candy Peterson. And they're just the best and the brightest this state has to offer for leaders and people who care about this state and local government. And uh, Luke Fisher and I are privileged to work at this organization. We are privileged to have gotten to know you. And it was important for us to come and say that to you, to your peers, and to your community and city. You mean a lot to us, and you've done a lot, and you've added a lot of value. And D. Love says it very well. He says, we're stronger together. And Brad Wiersum said, we're better because of you. And I think that's a good way to capture the essence of what we're here for. And so one of the things that we wanted to do as a team is to see if there are any questions about the league or anything we do or any, any curiosity about what we do and also give Candy, obviously, a chance to to respond, but uh, so that's it for formalities, but we're here for questions or discussion or any other content you might want to have about the work that we do as an organization. Thank you. You mean Luke's not going to have a shot at me? Good. Fine. Fine. Thank you. Does anybody have any comments? I love the league. I, I, like Brad said, it's probably my pinnacle of my public service. I just, I've learned a lot. They're knowledgeable, you call them, they answer your questions, they reach out. 
Um, I had mentioned that Joe Emerson, a longtime member at White Bear Lake, had a retirement party. They showed up. It was cold out in December. It was a couple weeks before Christmas, and they showed up, and she loved it. So, I mean, it's a family, and it's a people business. It's, it's you know, I'm going to miss you guys, but I know I can. I'm just a phone call away. So, thank you. I have a question. I'm a newer elected, elected, and, and I'm just curious on what this June uh, conference will be like. <laughs> okay, okay, ask the right Thank question. You so much, Lisa. Yep. Uh, I'm Luke Fisher. I'm deputy director at the league, uh, and I'm a candy enthusiast too, so uh, happy to be here tonight. But our annual conference is a chance for elected and appointed officials from across the state to come together to learn uh, with each other, to network with each other, and hopefully to grow and develop as leaders. Um, our program this year is coming together quickly. It'll be uh, at the end of June, if I believe, uh, June 24th through the 26th, if I remember right, um, offhand. But we're really 22nd to 24th. This is why Candy is a great board member. Um, but our programming uh, this year focuses a lot um, on the things that we've already talked about tonight, civility, Braver Angels will be there. They're a group that uh, works across the country on helping elected officials with different ideas, have better conversations with each other, that's important. We've got programming around diversity and equity and inclusion. Uh, we've got stuff on leadership, crisis communication, and, and just being a better city official. So there's a lot to do there and we're really proud of the programming that we have and, and the program that we're putting together. But just as, as important as all of that is the conversations that you have in between and the chance you, you have to um, be inspired uh, by your colleagues and, and other officials from across the state. Does that help answer your question? Yes, thank Perfect. you. Perfect. We hope you come. To it. Yeah. Very good, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, guys. Appreciate it. Parking lot to this room. Yeah. Hey, Mr. Morgan. Good evening, acting mayor and members of the council. Uh, this next item uh, for the workshop here tonight is follow-up uh, staff uh, with city council. So you may recall discussion within the surface lot, the city surface lot that is scheduled for um, pavement and utility improvements this summer in 2022 was discussed by the council previously and uh, council asked staff to take a look at um, opportunities for enhancing pedestrian access through the parking lot um, as a potential uh, thing that could be included in the improvement project this summer. And so in your packet is a brief memo that just kind of outlines some of the differences that would be, or impacts I guess if you want to look at it that way, that. Uh, could be a part of making that change, which it's a fairly simple change, so there shouldn't be any concern about um, making that change even though um, you know the, the design is essentially finished and we're ready to start construction, but it is something that could be implemented fairly easily. Um, 
And there's also two layouts within your packet. So the first layout is kind of the existing design as it stood uh, before we uh, looked into this enhancement from a pedestrian or non-motorized um, standpoint. And then the second layout is uh, what staff would be recommend uh, for that actual pedestrian throughway. So I might, while you might look at the, um, the layouts, I'll just reiterate what's in the memo. Um, the original parking lot design expanded the number of parking lot stalls within the surface lot from 146 to 164, so that's an increase of 18 stalls. It's pretty significant. It's pretty rare when you kind of reconfigure a public parking lot, a surface lot, that you're able to find that much uh, efficiency, I guess, to be able to add that many spots. And that was kind of the task at hand originally when we started looking at this, knowing that there, with the increased development downtown, there's uh, uh, an increased need for public parking, both now and into the future as well, too. So that was kind of what we were trying to do originally. Um, now this uh, second option, which includes some pedestrian provisions within the parking lot, still increases the number of stalls from what is out there today. So that's certainly a positive, but it does sacrifice some parking. Um, so instead of adding 18, um, uh, it reduces that number by nine. So it's an increase from 146 stalls to 155. So 11 total stalls uh, would be, I'm sorry, uh, nine total stalls would be the increase. So slightly less, we'd still have an expansion of surface parking, surface public parking in the parking lot. Uh, we still would have an enhancement from an ADA parking stand, uh, approach within the parking lot from what's out there today. So that's another enhancement that doesn't, isn't really affected by this pedestrian way. But if you turn your attention to the layouts, I guess what I'll point out from a design aspect, um, it's fairly simple and straightforward. But in what we're, la what we're labeling on that layout is the 7th Avenue Alley, which is the alley, which is on the, the backage of those buildings that front on 7th Avenue. Um, we do need sufficient width out there, which it doesn't really have today. It's kind of ill-defined today, I guess, is what I found in looking at the existing condition. But we want to maintain at least a 22-foot through lane width through there for two-way traffic. Um, that's still kind of on the tight side, I guess, it, it, you know, standard parking lot design, um, two-way traffic, we might see a 24-foot, although in recent trends towards uh, lane widths has, have been narrower, uh, just to kind of um, bring things into the modern age. And so we're trying to apply that here. So 22 feet is kind of a, a bare minimum that I'm comfortable with for two-way traffic in the alleyway. And then if we were to provide some sort of a kind of dedicated area for pedestrians to walk in, that would be five feet in addition to that or next to that. Or, I'm sorry, five or six feet. We may have made it. No, it was five. So just to keep things as tight as possible. So once you move in that five feet, that does impact some of those stalls. We're kind of at an angle, so the impact is not linear. You kind of clip, clip stalls off at the edge of that alleyway there. That's where we lose um, about half of the stalls that we would actually add from the kind of original design from existing to future once we're done with the project this summer. So with that, what I would say is that it's a fairly easy change and almost negligible from a cost standpoint if you take the approach to just stripe out that pedestrian way, which is a reasonable approach. Uh, I've seen that done in school parking lots and other parking lots to just give people a place that's not, you know, at the edge of the drive aisle or in the middle of the drive aisle or wherever people want to walk. It gives them a place. Um, it's not really shown on the figure here, but, you know, either through signage or maybe some symbols on the pavement, it can be fairly made fairly clear that that's where you should walk if you're going to be walking in and out of the lot, either to Margaret Street downtown or to the other direction. Um, and there are some kind of cut through driveways. I mean, pedestrians might want to cut through to 7th Avenue on the east or northeast corner of the lot too. You don't really know exactly how it's going to get used. But it would allow for people to not have to walk like in the alley, for example, or on the edge of the alley. So it, it, is, a, it's, it is better from a pedestrian standpoint. Now, if 
Uh, and that would be also easy from a maintenance uh, point of view from public works. I mean, snow removal re wouldn't really be impacted. It would simply be paint on the ground, easy to maintain. If the paint needs to be refreshed, that's something that public works could easily do generally without having to hire a contractor is freshen up those, those paint markings. Um, it does just slide some of those islands over, but it doesn't um, mean that we need to take out the... Uh, electric vehicle chargers that uh, electric department is planning on doing and it doesn't minimize the number or reduce the number of handicap stalls at all. If you were going to take it a step further, I guess, um, to address the fact that that same area is generally where the low spot of the parking lot is and that's where the water runs and we might have like in a springtime situation where it, the snow is melting and maybe it rains or we have some sleety conditions, maybe it's not the most ideal place to walk. Now, so that's not necessarily a requirement, but in those low areas, we could add some concrete pavement at a little bit of a additional extra cost uh, just to kind of raise up that walkway out of kind of the low spot. So if it, if it was raining or if there was standing water, it would sheet off of that area where people would be walking and wouldn't be as prone to like icing up or something like that in the winter. So that would kind of be my recommendation. I think I... Uh, I said uh, approximately $50,000. I think it could be done for less than that. I mean, that would be something that I would try to get done for less than that. But if uh, you wanted to make that enhancement, that might be a good thing, just so we didn't have any kind of future issues with, as I said, standing water in an area that's kind of dedicated for people to be walking in, right? Um, so with that, I'll stand for any questions. That's kind of the overview and the facts here and staff is ready to make whatever adjustment the council would like given kind of that um, state of the uh, parking lot, I guess, if you will, in terms of making that pedestrian enhancement. Excuse me. Yeah, on both of these um, designs, these islands, are they... I mean, there's looks like there's one that's got like dots in it. Is that indicating it's grassed? And then others, there's just lines. Is that just flush with the with the uh, the parking lot? Is and then this one at that at this this other end where there's no lines. And is that just a concrete? Is that how I'm interpreting that? Or yeah, so there's actually yeah, you're actually picking up exactly what's going on here. So there's three different types of islands, if you will. So the hatching, and that's the hatching is not to scale, but that would be paint that's surface, you know, asphalt paved. Um, it's hatched so that people don't park there, but it's also much easier to maintain for public works, which was one of the other goals, kind of um, in terms of how to redo this parking lot, such that uh, snow removal could be conducted where you just you know, plow right through that, right? In the lower left-hand corner, the, the southwest corner of the lot, there's two islands that have uh, dots, as you mentioned. Those are actually raised with curb around them and then concrete. And uh, at least one and possibly both of those will have the EV chargers located in them, so they need to have kind of a raised area to protect those, that kiosk, um, and there may, we may need to add some bollards as well, too. That will be kind of up to, to the electric department to install that after the fact. And then we would pour concrete kind of around that kiosk as well. <clears throat> and then in the lower right-hand corner, which is the southeastern corner of the lot, and there's a it's kind of a slope there, and there's a tree now here today. So that actually is getting reconfigured as well. Um, to try to add parking as much as we can in that corner. That's one of the places where we, we were able to actually add stalls. Um, and so that is raised up as well, but that is going to be, at least for now, the idea is for it to be landscaped. We don't have that scheduled for concrete. There's a, there would be a concrete maintenance border around the outside, which will keep you know dirt or mulch or whatever it might be in there from falling out onto the pavement but other than that that would be an opportunity for a little bit of greenery or landscaping but something that would be low maintenance you know wouldn't have to be mowed wouldn't have to be pruned or anything like that that would be the idea in those areas where the 
proposed EV charges are? Those just aren't large enough to have like a tree in the middle of it or something, you know? I mean, it just seems like, it seems like we were trying to get away from just paving everything. And if we can, you know, add some sort of landscaping or trees obviously help, you know, with shade and water absorption. And, um, I don't know. I just, I guess that was my question is, is there, what's the landscaping plan for these islands, if any? Yeah, so there's, there is no landscaping plan right now because the idea was to make it low maintenance and make it as easy to maintain as possible. So the existing configuration with the grass islands is very difficult for public works to keep looking nice, uh, both from a snow removal standpoint and also, as I understand it, mowing the grass on you know, something that's maybe three or 400 square feet and not only doing it in one location, but having to do it in multiple places throughout the lot. So they wanted something that was gonna be easy to keep looking nice um, and keep functional in the winter time when it's time to keep the snow off it. Um, if the council wants to direct the addition of uh, some landscaping in you know, one or both of these raised islands, or even in the other the islands, I mean, I'll take that direction. It would go against kind of the direction I got from Public Works was to try to enhance the ease of maintenance. Sure. Well, I guess that would be my opinion. It would be, I mean, and as someone who used to be tasked with having to mow those islands, I would agree it's a huge <laughs> pain in the butt, and it, they never end up looking nice. They're just ruts getting in them, and it's just basically a weed bed, but not particularly looking at grass, but just, you know, I mean, we plant trees in the boulevard. They, you know, they grow out of the concrete when they're surrounded by concrete. Um, you know, it would just be nice to, if we're gonna do this, to, to consider that, and we're talking about three smaller islands. Mm -hmm. You know, it doesn't seem like it'd be a huge financial burden. I think the opportunity would be in the, in the the Western Islands, I think a tree apiece could be added um, in there, uh, not on the part of the island where the kiosk would be, which would be in the front of the stall, but in that kind of triangle that would be off to the side. So a typical kind of street tree or a downtown tree that you might see that could work within a tree grate or something like that, mm -hmm. that could be uh, um, worked into the, into the deck, I guess, if that would be very easily, and like you said, pretty low cost. Um, so I think there's an opportunity for a couple plantings there. And then certainly, um, you know, trees, we can consult with Josh, the city forester, and see what kind of, you know, trees could be planted in that other island so it's not just um, low vegetation. I mean, we could get some shade trees in there. The existing tree, as I understand, that's there in that, that southeast corner um, is scheduled to come out. And I don't know exactly what the issue is with it. It might be ready or diseased or otherwise, but Public Works has taken a look at that. But So if you're taking that out, nothing wrong with, um, you know, replacing that and letting those kind of, you know, grow in and um, replace the urban canopy, as it were. <clears throat> yeah, and I know Maplewood Mall did some extensive, you know, redoing of their parking lots, and you know, I just drove by there today, and you can see where they placed these little trees in these low-lying areas where kind of water diverts or whatever, but I don't know, it seems like that would be consistent with trying to, you know, go in that direction of having some green space type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as, you know, option A or B here, I guess I'm leaning more towards option A where we have more parking stalls, because I kind of compare it to the, you know, if you go park at Target or Walmart or any large facility has a large parking lot, they don't have like a, a raised or even, you know, a designated walking path. You just kind of walk along the car lines and you're, you know, got to be mindful of traffic and cars backing in and, and out. And so I don't really see the need to, to, to have a designated walking path um, to give up parking stalls where that's always a concern. We're talking about parking and, and the need for additional parking. So I think in this case, I would be, um, my preference would be to, to go with that option A, the 164 total. Anybody else? 
Yeah, may I? Um, yeah, move on. Thank you, Morgan, for putting up um, another option. Um, and I would agree with uh, Council Member Thorson in, in regards to the landscaping, trying to um, keep it a little bit green. Um, as for um, which design, um, I'm, I'm a big proponent for the second one. Um, I think it's consistent with our comp plan. Um, we wanna focus a little bit more on pedestrian friendly um, spaces and if, if that's gonna be our hot spot, we want people walking. So um, that's, that's all I got. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Member Wong. Um, Cole, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I won't take it. Uh, again, um, very similar to, to Council Member Wong and Thorson. I, I totally agree. We got some trees in there. Just, just it, it breaks up the, the sea of a parking lot, in my, it's my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, too, am an, a, am an advocate of the sidewalk. Um, in fact, I would like to see it with some type of an elevation, maybe similar to what was done on Lake, where they just kind of just put that little bit of curbing in there so that you can still run the, the cleaning equipment across it for snow removal, but it just um, designates just a, a little cleaner line between where the cars go and where, where residential walking is. Um, my other question, though, Morgan, is does this, I, I will call it the north side of the street, knowing that it doesn't run east-west, but the 7th uh, Avenue side of the of the alley. Does the city not have easements to some of that land over there, and could a sidewalk not be put on that side? Uh, Councilmember Cole, so we did look at that. Um, as to the question of does the city hold rights or easement there, you know, those are all, well, I shouldn't say that. They're not all zero setback, but some of the buildings do are built like right to the property line, uh, some. Others are not, and there's a little bit of space in some of uh, the buildings, like that's where they would put their trash container or something like that. Or maybe they've, maybe they've got like one stall there for a, a, a delivery truck or, you know, one employee can park a, a, a vehicle there. So also on that side is where all the power poles are and where all of the utility uh, from a electric and telecommunications, so like the phone and cable, they all, some of them go overhead into the buildings, some of them go down um, risers, that sounds dumb, down risers, they're called risers that go on the side of the pole, uh, but that's where some of the utility services would go then underground or wherever they're going. So um, that plus the fact that there is a little bit of undulation there and it just makes it a little bit tighter, I guess. Also. If you've got a kind of a dedicated pedestrian, pedestrian way at kind of the minimum width, if you're going to put it up against a wall, essentially that kind of, you lose like a foot or two because people aren't going to, you know, if they're, especially if they're passing one another, they're not going to walk right up against a wall. They're going to walk across the line or they're going to walk where they're comfortable. So it does, just from a design aesthetic standpoint, it makes a little bit more sense to be away from the buildings and that's why we kind of set on this alternative to recommend to, to you all. Yeah, perfect. Because I... I view this parking lot as, as having a lot of a lot of parking for people heading to Seventh Avenue or heading to um, Max when it opens. Um, so you're, you know, a lot of your traffic would be between cars and crossing aisles, and that was that's my one of my big proponents for for putting a sidewalk or a designated walk space. Yeah, uh, Morgan, can you with the trees? I like that idea too, and I am a proponent of the. Uh, would be a uh, proposal. Can you just add that, I mean, that, I mean, can't be that much more money, but can you get some money or uh, what, what it'll cost? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, and we might even be able to take, uh, depending on what Josh Bond and Public Works would say, I mean, we do have the Arbor Day tree giveaway. There's, you know, Public Works has trees available, and we're not talking about a large number of trees that would take away from the public. That might be one option. Or, I mean, essentially, the, you know, for a two inch or a two and a half inch caliper tree, which is what we would typically plant in a downtown urban setting like this, um, if you buy them bigger than that, they tend to not survive as well, right? So that's why we kind of stick with that two, two, two inch, two and a half inch size. But they're not that expensive. I mean, it's, we're talking, 
$350 to $500, I guess, to have it delivered and planted and have the contractor take care of it for a while, and we get a one-year warranty out of that. So if it dies in the first year, we can replace it the next year under the contract warranty. So we're not ta if we added half a dozen or even more trees um, total to the project, we're not talking about a significant um, change, and it's probably like a tenth of a percent of the total overall project cost to, to do that. I think, you know, and I'll have to ask the question, the, ask the council how we do it on time. So uh, is there a consensus in terms of, you know, option two or option one with the pedestrian way? And one council member mentioned that maybe an enhancement to kind of, like I said, an option f for some raised concrete would be um, something, again, for, again, f even if $50,000 on the high side is what we needed to do to add some concrete through there, um, that's a pretty small cost in relation to the overall cost of, of, the, of the overall project and certainly of the lot itself. So um, staff would welcome any direction the council would like to give on both of those points. I welcome our raised um, um, pathway walkway. I agree to all of that. Okay. Any direction you needed? I'm comfortable with that if you guys are. We will make those changes, and uh, that'll just become a part of the project. If there is a significant delta on the cost, I'll report on that at a later meeting. The only other piece, Morgan, I don't see on here is lighting. Ah. And there could be these little blue spots that are on here, but looking at it on my screen, they're, they're very, very small and it would be very difficult to read. My assumption is there's some type of parking lot lighting built into this plan. Yep, okay. so uh, the, uh, the technical term on construction plans that we use uh, is by others, right? And so the by others is by, not by a contractor, but by the city's electric department. And so the electric director, Brian Frandel, has been working with me and my staff. Um, so some of what will uh, be a part of the lighting is, will be under the contractor's responsibility. That would be kind of installation of uh, plastic conduit underground. Those are easily things that are easily done by a contractor that would be building a parking lot. But the things like the pulling the wire and the energizing and the setting of the transformers and that sort of thing, those would be things that Brian's crew, um, or sometimes he hires a contractor, but he would be responsible for after the fact. So yes, absolutely. I mean, the current state of the lighting out there is not good. Like a couple of the lights don't work. They've been kind of temporarily rigged together. Um, so. There will be all new lighting, new uh, bases, new standards and luminaires. I can't, I don't know the technic, technical term, but whatever the current standard for, um, you know, down lighting in parking lots that Brian is using now, I'm assuming they're LED lights and more energy efficient, that that will be a part of the end result. They probably won't be, that, you know, th that will be finished after the lot is constructed, so that might be towards the end of the summer before we see that in there, but that is a part of the effort. Sounds good. It's very well needed. We really need it, so. Anything else? Um, Council Member Thurston? Yeah, this, just quickly with the lighting, um, is there a... Uh, is, is that lighting gonna look like the design manual lighting or is it, it's kind of a... I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna speculate on where you're going with that. So the, the design manual might be more focused on what, what we call decorative street lights. So like what you see up and down 7th Avenue. So those are not, they're decorative street lights. They're not um, like safety lighting or what you might see in a parking lot. So they're they're likely going to be a newer version of like a, we call it a cobra head. So it's up and it kind of sticks over like a cobra head and then shines down. So that type of a light as opposed to like a decorative street light, just because it throws more light, it's more efficient that way. It's also a down light. We do have some residential properties in the area that, um, you know, some of those decorative street lights are not shielded. They kind of project out. So um, that's what I know about that. But if you, if, you want more specifics, I'd have to have Brian report on that. Well, maybe I would just ask, 
as you talk with Brian about the design and the lighting, just ask him if there is a, an opportunity to introduce a little bit of the decorative lighting. It might help to differentiate the pedestrian way oh. or in the islands or something. So there may be a way of accomplishing both things. That now that the, the pedestrian lighting. enhancement is in there, that's a perfect perfect point. So I will do that and have that discussion. And there might be an opportunity where some of those lights are of the acorn style or something like that that would fit into that. Yeah, just to wanted to clarify on those islands then, I mean, obviously there's consensus that we want to see some, you know, trees and, and landscaping type of thing. And um, I mean, I would just encourage public works to look into, uh, you know, options of staying away from as much concrete as possible. And just what, like, I'm looking at a Google Maps overhead here of the existing um, islands and it just looks like it's all concrete curbing and it's grass in between, and then there's trees planted. But if we're planting trees and we look at, instead of putting grass, like, you know, those decorative grasses that don't need to be mowed, or, or if it's, you know, perennial flowers, or what I know kind of adds to the, the uh, green, uh, North St. Paul green that volunteers to do that stuff, but maybe it's even stuff that's not needing constant weeding and things like that. But I know there's options out there. I'm not a a landscaping expert, but there's just got to be some other alternative to just concreting it. And I know that's probably public works preference because that's the least maintenance, but, you know, we're trying to, you know, stick to the current plan goals. And, and we've talked about some of these things that the redevelopment master plan as far as downtown is concerned and making it a little more attractive. So, and then also kind of unrelated to that, but related to this lot, since we have half an hour, um, we got an email from a resident last week, and I know I forwarded it to to city manager. I think it was addressed to all of us about some residents that live around this uh, parking lot, and they were inquiring about having permission to park their vehicles in the lot because they just don't have space because of however their lot's laid out, and they don't have a garage, and they don't have a driveway. Um, and we have rules in place that prevent 24-hour parking, especially in the winter, for snow removal. But I was just wondering if we had a chance to look into that and if the city manager was able to respond to that resident and if there's a solution to that. And Yeah, I don't have a final resolution, but there has been ongoing conversation between all the department heads. It really involves um, a, a couple of departments, and so uh, police and, and public works. Um, so we will be getting back to the resident. Uh, I, um, actually, Morgan may have even been um, CC'd on some of that. Um, so we're close to an answer, but we have not yet provided that. Because I mean, <clears throat> my opinion on that is, I mean, obviously we have concerns where we're not, we don't want to turn this into just, you know, everyone parks your trucks and vans and things and lets it sit there. Um, but, you know, if there's if there's a reasonable request and it's a resident, that's you know actively moving their vehicles during snow events and they're just looking for a place to park because they don't have it i mean it is a public parking lot after mm -hmm. all. and it kind of seems you know we've had these rules in place forever about you know no parking past you know certain time and and things like that and uh, maybe that's just worth revisiting those policies to see if they still make sense today um I don't know. That's just my opinion is that it, it seems the you know, their request was reasonable, but I understand it's not our decision to make. But if if it's they're told no because of a, a policy that the council adopted that we may be able to change, then maybe we should, you know, have some discussion about that. Sure. And I guess I would commit that uh, I, I I believe that the request was reasonable too. And if we can't give them a reasonable answer, uh, then I'll bring it back to you. Yes. Yeah, I, I was, I'm glad we had the time because that was top of top of mind with me as well was the email because it didn't didn't appear unreasonable. No. And when we have you know can't park on the streets and you've got you know excess of vehicles and you can't park in the front yard, you can't. We've got to have a place for them. But to to Councilmember Thorson's point, it is a it is a slippery slope. Um, how do you control it? How do you maintain it? How do you ensure that you know vehicles aren't there for you know extended periods of time? Uh, and as the Sentinel building continues to fill up and when it hits vacancy, 
Um, I, my assumption is we'll have, could potentially have similar requests coming from residents there as well. So um, while it's, you know, a, a population of one right now, it could definitely grow to additional requests. So we should probably look through, vet, vet it properly. And those are the exact considerations we had. Uh, it really filled into a couple of categories. One is uh, there had been some history um, of like our, uh, recreational vehicles being parked, and we want to make it clear that that's not appropriate. Um, but then with um, you know cars and trucks, uh, we want to take the that exact approach that if uh, we allow it for this one household, we've got to allow it for everybody uh, and making sure that we uh, can accommodate that. Uh, we have had issues with the Sentinel building with plowing um, and perhaps uh, that's something we would even want to encourage uh, is that during snow events that there are some city um, municipal lots that would be available for people if, um, to get their cars off of the streets to make plowing easier. So it's a uh, you know, like any situation, once you start kind of picking at it, it gets more complicated than it, it than at first look. Uh, but I do think we'll have a good answer for this uh, for this person um, yet this week. Thank you. Uh, are we all done with Morgan? You got what you needed. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Very yeah. good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other business, uh, City Manager John Stark. Not for the workshop. Okay. Well, can we adjourn then? Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. And that was kind of a nice, I bumped into Luke in the parking lot and